to the very important 2011 election where supposedly there would be a successor to President Mubarak. So it's a big push to get the economy going so that uh, the regime could show something at the fall of 2011. And, and, and that, at the end, doesn't really work. But there are some limitations in these reforms, I should note. Uh, private investment doesn't pick up, capital fly, flight remains high, uh, and you, while tariffs come down, the economy is open, non-tariff barriers start creeping in, uh, the banking sector is liberalized, however, we see the new private banks uh, lend in a very concentrated way to just a few very large customers, mostly this, this, this coterie of 30 or so uh, large, I would call them cronies, from now on, I think it's an accepted term in uh, political science literature in the Middle East. Uh, and, and, and as energy prices start going up in, in the mid-2005, energy subsidies, including to industry, shoot up enormously. So there are some clouds. And uh, here is uh, investment. Uh, it's it's uh, interesting to, to look at it from the mid-'80s. Uh, you know, investments been declining in Egypt. It partly has to do with public investments declining as the state is rolled back. The hope is that it will be replaced by the private sector, and this is private investment. It actually goes up a little bit, but but not much. It stays for much of the period at around 10% of GDP. With Mubarak too, with Gamal, it goes up a little bit, but then comes back towards 10% of. So it doesn't go up to the 20 plus percent level that would generate the kind of growth. Part of the reason, part of the reason is capital flight, which we've estimated. I mean, that's not a number that is reported. It's a kind of a residual in the balance of payment. We calculate it from trade invoicing. Uh, and you see capital investment has been large in Egypt, and, and, and it remains large. Uh, it goes up to 10% and then stabilized about 5% of GDP, very large. That's one of the reasons why, uh, or it goes together with the fact that we don't see private investment rising. So GDP growth is, is, is not bad. You know, It goes up to 7% before the global crisis, but you have to remember in per capita term, that's 3 4% only. Not, it, it is not bad, the, the, the story, the big storyline is that Egyptian growth is moderate, but it doesn't reach the, the high level that would be needed given the youth bulge to take advantage of, of the demographic transition that's happening in Egypt. And, uh, and so, so what, w to what extent what we're observing has to do with, with chronism, and what is the role of chronism in the story? Now, the political science literature in the Middle East speaks a lot about chronism. Uh, the, the earliest I've seen, or I may be wrong, <coughs> for Egypt is the Sadowski book uh, on political vegetables, where he makes a lot out of chronism at all levels. Uh, to get in business, you have to be connected. But then it's developed by uh, in Roger Owen's book. Uh, Henry S. Springer's book is all about chronism uh, all around the region. King has a, has a book that shows how difficult it is for Arab regimes to pretend to have elections, to, 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 to be in a situation where you've opened up the economy but not the policy. How do you stay in control? That's the, uh, the big theme. Uh, <coughs> and these are two, two nice quotations, I think, Henry and Springboard. Uh, how to manage capital by all means, including using intimidation, predation, uh, to discourage manifestation of political behavior by, by business elites. That's according to this this is one of the main drives. How to make sure that the opposition doesn't get financed, that uh, powerful people are not autonomous, but owe you. Uh, so support for the opposition is a red line, uh, punishable by closure. Owen, uh, the Arab regime produced uh, crony capitalism, competition stifled, um, they could break legal constraint when, when it suited them, but they had to put up themselves with the demands by the regime uh, to, to, to finance activities, clientelism, which were good for the regime. 
And so really the key allegation of, of this literature, and, and, and they are loose allegations, I mean, they're not things that you can easily prove. And what we would focus on here is, is showing the economic aspect of things, but the political side of the ledger in this, in this alleged gift exchange is very hard to see. But this, so this, this, this literature basically argues that what the transition we see in the 90s from a state-led development to, to, to an open market uh, is not really so much about liberalization as much as it is about the rewriting of the rules for the rulers to consolidate their power. Their power has been eroded by the fall of the state, the, the, the failure of import substitution, uh, and, and, and they find a new way to, to, to make alliances with the business elite in ways that strengthen, actually re-strengthen their, 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 their hold on power. This graph is simply to show you how big is the rollback of the state. This is the state in Egypt state expenditure, uh, <coughs> 1974, it peaks at 68% of GDP. Uh, Mubarak comes to power, I think, in, 19, in 81. And his job, really, the state, he inherits a bankrupt state, basically. Uh, and his job is to, is, to, is to reduce expenditure to stabilize the budget, which happens in various bits here. Is this that initially? Then he does it more in the 90s, but he has no choice. But he also benefits from the Iraq invasion to get international support to do that. And then again, the 2000, uh, 2000 uh, the, 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 the 9 11 is used again to, to get more support. But look, he brings down the state basically to, to 30% of GDP, cut in half. So you can imagine that the way of retaining uh, this autocratic power. And, and win all those elections uh, without state support in terms of spending here and there, increasingly gets difficult and needs to be replaced by, by another system. And so, you know, the literature talks about moving to another regime, which is a regime dominated by uh, partly uh, a repressive regime, you know, increased repression partly carrots to important constituencies such as the middle class. Uh, Ragli argued that one of them are bureaucrats. Uh, we don't see that exactly in the spending picture. But, but part of it is through subsidies to the middle class. And part of it is to, 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 uh, to get the economy developed by friends so that it, it's not dominated by the opposition and counting on, the, on your friends to finance your, 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 your party activities and uh, your electoral campaigns and the like. And so for this to work, you have to pretend to liberalize, but then provide privileges to these friends so that they can grow actually very large. And uh, after 2000, they have to do that without access to finance from state banks. So really it moves to a more complicated system of, of, uh, of regulations that are captured by these elites. And we'll show you some of those now. If I may interrupt. You said pretend to liberalize. Why did they have to pretend? What, what these were extraordinary um, authoritarian regimes. I mean, what, why do they have to play this game? What's the well? They need the private sector. What? What? Because what? the state is pulling out, and you have to create jobs in order to survive. Actually, but why did they shrink the state? Uh, because the, uh, uh, the revenue. Uh, I mean, initially, state enterprises don't deliver. And moreover, so efficiency. So they were looking for efficiency. Was that the, the idea? I mean, this is exactly what happened in, in, in most countries that started with uh, kind of uh, state led growth and import substitution. In the 80s, those systems kind of uh, reached their, uh, their, their high point and then couldn't deliver anymore. They became very inefficient. And in the case of Egypt, I don't know, I don't have the revenue curve here. Mm -hmm. You have much less with. with signing of the peace agreements in the 80s, you have much less uh, support from the Arabs. Uh, and then as oil prices come down, much less uh, uh, so resources so from the so Gulf so as so well. So, 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 so that I know better. So budget constraints. Budget constraints. So budget constraints. they were bankrupt in the 80s. They went bankrupt. The IMF had to step in and they had so to. So you need new sources right. of growth. Mm -hmm. So it's a dilemma. You need to open up. Economy, you don't want to open up the polity, but then you want to open up the economy in ways that keep control. Keep control. Uh, 
uh, so, so one of the claims that we want to examine, uh, two claims, one is, uh, or three claims, one is that they are prone. I mean, these are very impressionistic, nobody's measured it actually. Second is that they have access to privileges and, uh, and that those are not like claiming. There's something else that allows them to be ahead and to therefore get private sector lending from private banks. And, and third, that important claim that this system reduces competition and gives you an economy that's not very dynamic, doesn't grow a whole lot. So the, the, the fault of this moderate growth is, uh, is chronism and is this unwillingness to open up the, the, the policy. And so really these authors claim that the real constraint for growth in Egypt and in many countries of the Middle East is not technocratic. It's not about the World Bank or the IMF telling these governments what to do, uh, giving them good ideas. It's a political concern. They don't want to open up the world. Uh, so, so how do we test uh, this kind of things? You know, I mean, industrial, we can, favoritism is not necessarily bad. It's, it's part of industrial policy. One could argue it's necessary for growth in markets that are incomplete, in environment that where the bureaucracy is, is predatory, and it could be good. We've seen uh, good industrial policy of that sort in, in, in South Korea, for example, where a group of chebols were favored, but they were disciplined and they delivered growth. Uh, so maybe Egypt is like that after all. How do we, or, or maybe it's bad, maybe it's bad. So uh, how do we empirically discriminate between these two possibilities? And that's what this work tries to do. Uh, any evidence of treatment of, of, of preferential treatment? Uh, <coughs> any evidence that the, the CF connected firms can capture uh, protected sector, can capture subsidized sector? Maybe they lobby for this protection. Are they run inefficiently? You know, are they selected on the basis of loyalty rather than managerial excellence? Uh, do we see a lack of competition and? Uh, in sectors that are dominated by the economy. So that's the kind of hypothesis that we want to test. Um, but I will not show you regressions because I know you don't like it. I'll show you the results of, of our regression and try to explain a little bit what we do. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a hypothesis that we don't test here formally, but that is, I think, very important in the big picture. Uh, and I'll come back to it later, is that uh, basically the system got stuck in a crony trap. Uh, and that the heightened political risk with 2011 approaching uh, contributed to cap flight to investment and to kind of uh, to, to the whole regime getting into the war. So that will be, in the conclusion, an, uh, an alternative to ragged destination for, for the Arab Spring, one where it's not the state, but it's rather the private sector that's the main uh, that's guilty party. That's failing. It's ah. the private sector that's failing. Yeah, the private sector that's failing. All right, I'm so sorry, that's your thesis? Or that's yeah. the conclusion? Yeah, that's the conclusion. So who are the connectors, and how do we kind of select them? Uh, we focus on a bunch of uh, businessmen, 32, that every Egyptian seems to know. And the way we pick them is basically from the four think tanks that were created around Gamal Mubarak. The, 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 the boards of the Economic Center for Policy Study, uh, the, the Future Generation Fund, the Egyptian American Chamber of Commerce, and the fourth one, what is it, Mark? Uh, the fourth one. The the Sorry? There's an easy way. The 34 of them are members of the ruling parties. They are all members of the ruling <laughs> parties, many are ministers, uh, head of committees at uh, uh, in Parliament, most of them are in jail now, they're all facing trials. Uh, and so, I mean, they're, they're very recognizable. Um, now, we, we look at the companies they own, and we identify 104 companies, public companies that they, they own. There, there may be more than that. But these companies being public, and at some point, many of them were traded on the stock exchange, there is public information on these companies. Uh, and then we go, f f so, so these companies, they either own them or own large shares of them, or they serve as CEOs, board members, or they are major shareholders. So we get 104 firms. Then we look at each firm 
uh, and many of these firms are funds or have subsidiaries, so we locate all the subsidiaries of these funds and firms, and we find another second tier of firms, and so altogether we end up with 469 companies controlled in some ways by these 32 very connected people. Now we also have stock market information for actively traded firms on 22, so a small subset of those. Those are 22 of, of the largest 116 firms that constitute the EGX 100, the largest 100 firms on the stock market in Asia. So uh, I think this is kind of the important entry point to test all kinds of things. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about these. So, uh, I mean, this is a very concentrated group. Uh, ten of them actually have concerns in 322 firms. Many of these firms are interrelated in, in, in many ways. Uh, many of them are part of holding companies or mutual uh, investment companies. And, and this is how the 469 break down. Uh, 47 have a CEO among these 32 people. And then board members, ownerships, uh, and, and this is participation by uh, equity. Uh, in particular Hermes and uh, uh, another, uh, what is it called? Uh, right, are, are very s strong in this market. The, uh, they, they tend to be large firms. The 263 of the 400 that we have information for in terms of employment employ 300,000 people plus, so if we have the same ratio for all of them, they would be employing about 560,000 people. Um, they, uh, uh, this is an amazing number. In 2010, uh, these companies, even though they're only a small share of the total number of companies, including large firms, I'll show you more statistics, get 92% of the loans going to the private sector in Egypt. I mean, the dynamic growth of shows numbers are amazing. They start kind of large, but as large as the other large firms, and then they grow tremendously and literally take over the private sector between 2004 and 2010, so in, 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 a, in, a, in a short period of time. Um, so uh, the, if you look at the sectors in which they are, they're, they're about half the sectors in the economy and also have the sectors in manufacturing. So we, some of the tests would be to look at sectors with cronies compared to sectors without cronies, and that comparison is meaningful because uh, it's about half with and half without. So we'd ask whether the half without is more dynamic than the half with. Uh, these are the sectors where they are, so they basically enter in sectors that are growing, that have space for growth and occupy that new space. Tourism, uh, you know, they developed the Sinai Peninsula, big real estate project around Cairo, construction, wholesale and retail. You know, this is the period where you get supermarkets everywhere, and uh, that sector become uh, much more modern. Uh, mining, big uh, oil deals. Uh, several of the privatized banks are theirs. Uh, and only some manufacturing sectors. Uh, they, they have uh, old licenses. And as I said, they are vertically integrated. Uh, they are, as you could see, in, in, in all these sectors. This is the number of the, the different types of cronies, if you like, by sectors. And this is one example of a pyramid. Uh, this is the, the, the Talat Mustafa holding group. You see they're financed by, by Hermes. Uh, they own many subsidiaries. One reason for having all these subsidiaries is it's kind of typical to have these pyramids of structure in family dominating firms. It allows you to maximize what you can get for your equity. Uh, you can control this group with only 50% of ownership, uh, and this, the third range with 50% of this, so only 25% from here. You can really maximize the leverage of your capital. And also, it was very interesting in terms of tax laws in Egypt to go to the stock market. You don't pay capital gains, so as you sell bits of your company, you get your money out, you can put it in other uh, businesses or abroad if you want to diversify. 
without paying any tax. And also when you're a big group, banks can't lend you anymore because these are relatively small banks. They can only lend 5% of their equity to any particular firm. And so you, uh, by, by breaking into pieces, you can bring in more loans from, from the banks. Uh, so here you see he's starting to divest on 40%. Uh, and, uh, and and I bet over time uh, they will sell more shares of here and move the money somewhere else. Uh, you said that the, the, uh, the tax exempt sales. The the, 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 the the capital gains tax. Capital gains. There is no capital gains. Why is that? Uh, on stock market transactions. That was a law instituted to encourage the development of the stock market. This is another group. Uh, okay. So the first thing we're going to ask is uh, what's the value of connections? Can we estimate how the market perceives the value of connections? So we have a beautiful experiment. You know, there is an unexpected revolution, and suddenly, you know, the master of connections disappears in jail. The stock market reopened in March. All stocks are repriced. You would expect that the stocks of the connected firms suddenly would be lower, and the difference between before and after would reflect the value of connections. And so we do this event study to estimate the value of those connections. Um, this is the stock market index before it collapses during this period of the, the uprising. Everything gets repriced. These are the stocks divided in five categories, those that fall most and least. Uh, and, and, and you see they fall and they stay low. It's interesting. This, uh, the, the middle group kind of converges. The one that collapses most remains lower. And we do a formal kind of event study and you can controlling for various things. You can find by how much the value of the firms we have found as being connected falls by more than, than the market. And the magic number we find is 23.4%. And so we take 23.4% to be the way the market values uh, their connections. So that number relative to the value of the stocks is something around seven, eight billion dollars. This is simply for these 22 firms for which we have stock market data. So in a sense, they have, you could say, one fifth of their value comes from connections. Uh, that gives you a feel for the magnitude of, of those privileges relative to other assets they hold. OK, that was number one. Number two, we can look at these firms' behavior between 2003, 4, and 2010. In which ways are they different from other firms? And there are other large firms, actually. There are maybe a quarter of the large firms. There are many others. Uh, and so we can compare to other firms. What we find is that, again, all these are regressions, controlling for all kinds of things. But these are the results. Uh, they grow much faster than, than, than the non-connected firms. They become dominant in their sector, and often they have monopoly profits. They borrow much more. Uh, the 22 borrow 74% of the credit. Remember I told you the 400 borrow 90% of the credit. Uh, we also find that their tax payment is similar. So a priori, there doesn't seem to be tax to be the, the, kind of the, the, the main privilege they get. There's some numbers here for you to show. This is the evolution of the share of total debt they have. These are the connected firms. So they start quite large, but they, 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 they get larger. The other ones, the non-connected, get smaller. That's the share of total loans going to the private sector. This is their market share. Their market share, uh, it's really the market share of the others that comes down. In, in the regression, you find the average differential is 8.3% of market share. So I don't understand market share? Uh, the market share in their sector. What share of the markets they have in the <coughs> sector which operates. So the, the uh, this is the average market share for all connected firms. And so it's 8.9%. So a typical connected firm has 8% of the market in which it operates. Mm -hmm. It's quite large. But it's not a monopoly though. Well, uh, I mean, in the rate of return regression, if you put the market share, there is a positive sign. So it shows that market share gives you more earnings. 
and so on. There is evidence of some power, of some some power, some market power. The debt to equity ratio is interesting. It becomes again the average. These are not regression, just averages. They become more leverage over time, and the non-connected firms become less leverage over time. They withdraw, and these become very leverage, 140 percent of equity. And this is just the average size of the asset or the median, I think. So you see the non-connected firms start at, this is 100 million, the average. This is again my small sample of 122 large firms. And they end the period at 140 million. These guys start at 110 million and end at a billion. So the average size or the median size goes up seven times. They really grow very fast, take all the loans, occupy market share. That's probably the picture. And so the next question is, how do they do it? I mean, a priori, they don't have access. It's not that Mubarak calls the private banks and tell them, you know, give money to these guys. They must look good to bankers. And, you know, bankers that we talk to love them. But why do they love them? So we're trying to find some evidence that they have privileges. And the first question is, are they in sectors where there is less import competition? Less competition from uh, imports. You know, sectors that have rents. That, that they could therefore be captured. Now, in, 2000, in the 2000s, tariff barriers came down in Egypt, so you were not protected anymore. But in parallel, I mean, these and other businesses lobbied for non-tariff barriers uh, to, to protect themselves against imports. These are uh, kind of sanitary measures, price control, tec various technical barriers where you can keep imports out for various reasons. Typically, an inspector has to go and check and approve to keep these. Uh, and so we ask, uh, are they overrepresented in those sectors? And, and, and we find that they are. If, if you look at the share of politically connected firms in sectors protected by no tariff barriers compared to all the other firms, the numbers are higher. And if you ask, are they in industries protected by more than one barrier, two, three, four, the numbers become dramatic. So uh, they are in industry with at least one protection, yeah, 82 versus 56 percent. But if I go down to say three protections, then 71, 71 percent of them are in, in in sectors with at least three protections versus only four percent for other firms. So they seem to be really specialized in maximizing protections. Now whether they're taking advantage of existing protections or influencing the way these protections are put together uh, is a question. Uh, Ahmed Aiz, after all, was uh, head of the committee in charge of uh, kind of uh, that regulation of trade, but also regulating monopoly. So they had influence, policy influence as well. And so this is, I think, very strong evidence that at least they go in protected sectors. The next question is, how do they keep domestic competitors out of these sectors? Uh, I presume there is a million ways, and we're not going to find exactly how it happens. But we found uh, one piece of evidence, which is uh, they benefit a lot from energy subsidies. And we're looking for other pieces of evidence in terms of licensing in particular. Uh, energy subsidies grow a lot in Egypt. Uh, they, they, they reach 11% of GDP in 2010, which is enormous. And the energy subsidies to energy intensive industry are about a quarter of this. So we're talking about close to 3% of GDP going to industry. This is about half public investment in infrastructure. So it's, it's, a, it's a micro number. If this is eliminated, you could expect many more roads and the like and higher growth rates. And, and we're looking for macro effects. And so this is the evidence. Uh, these are energy intensive industries. Again, it's an industry comparison, and 36% of our 400 and some connected firms uh, benefit from energy intensive uh, sector support, and only 8% of the non cronies. Uh, they are not in sectors that are low, they're much less in the low energy intensive sectors. So, if I don't understand, were they getting subsidies when the others weren't, or they were picking sectors where there were, there were those subsidies? I mean, frankly, we don't know. But in the regression, there is this 
bizarre effect, which is when you look at profits, profitability in the energy intensive sectors, cronies versus non cronies, they make more profits uh, than the average firms, uh, about 25%, I think. And the, uh, the non cronies make less profit in this sector. So there seems to be some evidence from profitability that these uh, energy subsidies, uh, there's some disc discretion in the way in which they're provided. And they are especially good at getting them. But we, we need to look more at the particular way in which you know, firms get access to subsidized diesel. I understand that because you haven't shown the regression. So this is just showing the percentage of their presence yeah. in the sector. Exactly. In the sector. Exactly. exactly. OK, so let's move on. Now, do they perform better? You know, they have access to privileges. Uh, maybe they are kind of the front line in this industrial policy. You expect them to do better and to kind of raise the whole economy behind them. Do they do better, or are they picked actually because they're friendly rather than good managers? That's the question now. Uh, again, it's no regression again, but uh, some evidence. If you just look at straight averages at the beginning, you would see that they are here against other firms. In terms of employment, this is the number of people they, they employ on average. And so they, they, they have, uh, this is in industry, right? Uh, no, this is among all these firms. So it's, uh, uh, we have several data sets, that's one of them. So they, they have 11% of, of the employees, 60% uh, of the profits of all these firms and 92% of the loans. So you see the profits are, if you compare it to loans, it's low. If you compare it to labor, it's high. Obviously, there's a sector effect. So I need to, uh, it may be that the profitability is high because they're good, or it may be it's high because they are in profitable sectors, capital intensive sectors. So we need to do some regression analysis again so to, to no disentangle that. There's no regression that you've done on that? Yeah. There is? There is. And what's what the I reason? sent you already. Oh, uh, this is their profitability over time, on average, compared to other firms. Again, it may be because they are in profitable sectors, but I want to show you that because it's interesting how it collapses after the revolution. Uh, that's after the revolution? Uh, after. Uh, well, February. During. During, thank you. Yeah, I don't have more recent data. Uh, so how do we assess profitability in, in, in two ways? We, we control by sectors, basically look at profitability by sector. And what we find is that uh, in the smaller sample, we find that they are you know, sector by sector, they're less profitable. So, so these are the small sector samples, these are very large firms, are less profitable than other very large firms by, by three percentage points, which is quite large. And in the large sample of 492 firms, they have about the same profitability as the other sector by sector, but no more, in spite of the fact that they have access to, uh, to, 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 to privileges. And we control for size also, so it's not the size effect. Uh, but what's interesting is that we find that where they have high profits, that are two sectors, basically. The sectors protected from import competition and the high energy sectors. It's these two types of sectors where they have more profits than others, and that's what gives them an edge in the big picture. So they seem to be taking refuge to be capturing, basically, uh, that protection to be making more money. So I thought that they, you know, you showed before that they didn't have a privilege in factories. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So right. maybe they are, uh, in order to, because it's taxes that we cannot erase, then they would be able to kind of play in the net, in the, in the net profit. They may be moving their profits in ways to minimize the tax between their subsidiaries to transfer prices. But that doesn't really completely erase the taxes. It may be that some companies are spending directly on political activities from the company's books. And so the profits look small. 
Uh, but a priori, we have found from what they're declaring, no evidence that they're underpaying taxes. And it's meaningful, because in other countries, you do find that connected firms. So you know, a priori, this is showing that the tax authorities are not part of this game. But that's what the numbers show. Yeah? I was struck by the uh, debt ratio. You want me to for another at five? Yeah, if you can finish yeah. at five, then we have half an hour to go. That's I want to five. Okay, because there okay. were also Sorry, I'll come back questions. Yeah. yeah, all right. So the last bit of the kind of uh, empirical work is on dynamism, right? Is there less dynamism? Is there less competition? Can low growth be explained by less uh, less competition? This is kind of difficult work, it's a small literature out there, and uh, we were amazed that the first results are actually quite positive. Uh, again, I won't show you the regressions, but uh, the environment in which we are is, is one, and if you look at enterprise survey immediate uh, over time, what you see is, is uh, very little firm dynamics. It's, it's, a, it's not very dynamic sector. There are all big firms, and there are lots of small firms, and small firms age without growing, and the big stay big, and uh, there's very little exit among old firms. You don't feel that it's uh, kind of a dynamic, competitive sector altogether. Uh, if you look at the picture of all, these are old firms. I mean, this is an amazing work that Mark has done on the census of how many million Egyptian firms? 2.4 million. 2.4, that's every single Egyptian firm is somewhere in here. It's quite an amazing portrait of the private sector in Egypt. Uh, this is the size of the firms, and this is the age of the firms. And what you see is that a lot of them are here. Basically, they age back. You know, They age without growing. And you have the old big ones here kind of towering over everyone, including the, the, the cronies. And then the rest of industries, they just get born and they age. And they don't come this way. They don't. Uh, there's a missing middle here. And this is Turkey in comparison. You know, in Turkey, firms uh, you know, age and grow at the same time. And so they occupy much more the middle than in Egypt. That's a much more dynamic private sector. And the question is whether cronism has to do with that. Uh, if you like, uh, the big supermarket is here. And so you don't see small supermarkets. You see instead a lot of small shops. And the missing middle is there because the competition from these guys is so intense that it doesn't pay. The, the middle supermarket to, to build up in every neighborhood, they, they have too much of a disadvantage, and instead what you see is the growth of the informal economy. And so we run some regression to see whether, we compare sectors here, whether sectors with more cronies have less entry, have more skewness in the distribution of firms, uh, have, have more uh, small firms, uh, sorry, more small firms, yes. And, and we find that this is this is exactly the case, actually. Uh, so, and, and that we run on the census of 2.4 million firms. So, we do see that it, uh, firm dynamics weaken when the number of uh, politically connected firms operating in the sector rise. I think this is a very important result. Uh, we also look at the World Bank Enterprise Survey in terms of constraints that firms face, and we do find that in sectors dominated by cronies. Uh, there is uh, the perceived co competition by firms in this sector is less. They feel that there is less competition in sectors dominated by, by the cronies. Okay, so this, this kind of uh, concludes that, and so I want to try to bring, bring it together uh, <coughs> in terms of the bigger picture. What, what, what we've looked at cronism, we find that the claims of the political scientists are broadly correct. They were lucky, even though they didn't look at the numbers. Uh, there is a small number of, of cronies that takes over the economy. Uh, they tend to operate behind uh, protection, barriers, external. They have internal privileges. They take a disproportionate share of the small credit. Nothing is left for the others, and so everybody's pushed into the informal economy. They are not more efficient than other firms. They're simply in more profitable sectors, and these are profits created by, by these protections. 
And uh, the, wherever they go, there is less competition and less mm -hmm. firms growth and less firm dynamics. And so we think, and we need more work to show that, that this adds up to a macro effect. But that can explain why Egypt is not growing at 8-9%, but rather at 4-5%. And why very few private sector jobs, the good jobs, are being created. Uh, <coughs> and so we think this is part, or I think this is part of, of the broader system that operated in Egypt, uh, where you know when when the state was rolled back, and that's uh, unlike Latin America, the the the, the 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 rulers did not open up the polity. There was no second or third. Uh, democratic phase, as happened uh, elsewhere. Instead, what they've done, these states, is uh, uh, increased repression and co-optation uh, without political opening, uh, and a semblance of electoral de de democracy, but then uh, increased cronism to, to dry out support for any possible supporters, uh, opponents rather. Uh, I mean, the best the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, could do was to dominate small shops, the informal economy. That's where, where they couldn't be you know, taken out of. But all the modern movements that came out, Kifayas and others, you know, no business person was allowed to support them. Uh, and, and this is to show you, these are this very nice database by, by Siri, that uh, these are two series. One is political openness, a little bit like uh, the Polity uh, Index, that shows you that there was less political openness over time. And the bottom one, the black one, is a very interesting uh, index that me measures uh, repression. And actually, it's an objective measurement of repression, how many people in jail and the like. And it really shows you how, while in the 90s, there was you know, uh, about level 4, 5, which is moderate. The repression in, in, uh, in the last period was, was much larger. And so repression was a very important tool to especially keep the poor and, and and the Islamist uh, under, under, under control, while subsidies that went increasingly to the middle class and the poor uh, increased a lot, put pressure on the fiscal account, made everything harder. But I guess the government felt uh, that they have no choice. This is subsidies as a share of the budget. See how it grows from 10 to, to 40% of the budget uh, over the last 10 years. And it mostly goes to urban uh, top quintile. The, the 20% richest in urban and rural areas take 50% of the subsidies, mostly in terms of fuel. And a big chunk also goes to industry, and it's taken by, by the cronies. Uh, now, jobs created, this is from Raghi, uh, uh, jobs created, you see uh, 98 versus 2006. In 98, the government has 32%, it drops to 25% of the labor force. Uh, this is the former private sector, it goes from here, from 8 to 10 percent. So it doesn't really do what it's supposed to do. And within the formal private sector, this is the size of the firms between the two dates. These are the 50 plus, the large firms, the cronies, if you like. They, they, or they are among them. They stay at 14 percent. They don't increase. So really, the hope was you know, to empower this group to grow the economy, and actually they don't. And the big question is, 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 is why they don't. Uh, another thing uh, that happens in society, which ultimately plays very importantly in the uprising, is the perceived rise in inequalities. But partly the 1% mega rich, and these are the, the cronies that become billionaires, basically. Uh, the 10% the, the formal labor market are much richer than the other, you know, the bankers and the like. But, but also, very importantly, this inequality of opportunity, I think Raghi talked about it. These are the wages for various years of education of people in the informal sector, in government, and in the formal uh, labor market. Uh, you may remember in the Yakubian building, there was this young guy that couldn't get into the police and ends up a terrorist. I mean, basically, imagine young people, they enter the market, and they'd love to be here, and you know, unless you have a wasta, you're from a good family, you can't, same here, so they end up here. For no good reason. They have as much education as their peers. But that's inequality of opportunity. Javad's been doing a lot of work on that. 
Uh, and indeed, when you look at the World Value Survey between 2000 and 2008, for all classes, you see a big perception in the rise of inequality. I'm showing that because we don't see it in you know, household type expenditure. And we think it's because uh, they, 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 they misrepresent the, the, the rich, and so they can't capture this kind of inequality. And so the potentially the, the grand story is that there was a big bet that you know we're going to keep the system closed and grow it enough to be able to win elections in the future. But for some reason, the bet doesn't work out. The, the, they can't manage the cronies properly. They don't generate enough growth. Uh, they see the elections coming. Uh, society is unhappy. You get into this crony trap, basically. They, they diversify their money abroad. Things get worse. And then you end up with the big bust of the, of the uprising. This will explain why it was 20 years delayed after the rollback of the state. Thank you very much. This was a fascinating look inside.